Hello, my name is Ryan from Buster Beagle 3D, and as promised in my review of the Xtool D1 Pro that you can reference at the link above, I thought I might do a little tutorial or run through on some of the features of Xtool Creative Space. It's one of the two options that you can use to control the D1 Pro. The other option being the paid software Lightburn, but even if you are planning to use Lightburn, you still want to install this software as it is the only way to not only update your firmware, but also adjust a few other settings on your machine that you can't adjust in Lightburn. I also wanted to point out that I'm not an Xtool employee, and this is a beta version of the software that I'm showing you, so things are certainly subject to change. This is just my understanding of how everything works, so I thought I would share that with you. So, I'm going to be under the assumption that you have already connected your machine to Xtool Creative Space. And I'll put a link up at the top right now that shows a link to the website where, it, where you can get that uh, accomplished. So the first thing that I'm going to do is actually look at my connected device. So I'm going to click on this little gear at the top. And here I can see the basic info of my machine. I'm using the 20 watt uh, Xtool D1 Pro. Uh, here you can check for updates for your firmware. You can also adjust the settings of your Wi-Fi. And then if I click on working parameters, uh, here you can change some of the settings that you can't change in Lightburn. So I can either go with a red cross, which is that laser line that you see off to the side of your machine. Uh, you can also change that to laser spot. I prefer to use the laser spot and not rely on those crosshairs. Uh, I just like to know exactly where the head of the laser is, um, but that's really just a personal preference. And then this red cross offset is where if, if that uh, red cross is off by a little, this is where you can adjust some of those settings. So for the flame alarm, one of the safety features of the D1 Pro is a flame detector. I found uh, through my review that it is just a little bit too sensitive. So you can go with high sensitivity, low sensitivity, or do not show again, which will just turn it off. Um, and then this stops when moved. So another safety function on the machine is that the laser will stop if it is bumped or if, the, uh, if it detects that it has tilted or something has fallen. Um, it, it'll shut off so you can turn that on or off if you want and then the last thing would be turning on or off the limit switches. So I'm going to close this and then if we come over here in the settings uh, here we can change our unit scale to either millimeters or inches uh, even though I'm in the US I prefer to use millimeters when I'm doing work on devices like this so I'll keep that change my language. This is check for updates and you can see that everything that I'm doing right now is the this beta version of the software. So again, things may have changed when you're actually watching this video, but uh, I'm going to keep everything the way it is right now. So right next to settings is file. So we can either create a new project, save the current project that is, is uh, being worked on, uh, open a project or save as. So the first thing that I want to do is just import an image in in, in case I wanted to um, engrave an image on the surface of wood or something like that. So the first thing that I'm going to do is click on image and I'm going to import this Rushmore image. So what this is called is a raster image, and this software can handle two different types of images. A raster image, which is like a picture, or a vector image, which is more of uh, like line art. So I'm going to go over this raster image first. So when it comes in, I can scale it by dragging on one of these corners. I can select it, click and drag, and move it around. Uh, I can also change those those parameters in the position or the size up here. I can also rotate. Um, so 
when it's selected, you'll see that I have some parameters over here. If I was to deselect it by just clicking off of it, you see that those parameters go away. So those parameters only come up when you have the object selected. So I'm going to select it. And again, because this is a raster image and there's no information here as far as uh, doing any type of cutting, this is just for engraving on, on a surface. So engrave is the only option that I have over here. Um, and above that and just below the connection to my laser, uh, it, you can see that right now I'm set to laser flat. So this would just be using the machine normally. Uh, you can also change this to laser cylindrical if you were using one of the rotary attachments and you wanted to do something on a tumbler or something like that. And then lastly, we have this laser super long. And to be honest, I'm not sure if that is for some sort of extension or if it's for a laser device that has some sort of pass through where it's on like it's almost like an infinite rollers. So let me know in the comments if you know exactly what that uh, is used for. But right now, uh, I'm just going to keep it on laser flat. So. With this image, we, we do have some uh, capabilities to edit it a little bit in the software. So the first thing they have are these set of filters at the top. There's only one in there right now. I'm assuming that this is going to grow with the software. So if you click this uh, grid filter, it almost does this type of um, newspaper print uh, image. Uh, so for right now, I'm just going to keep that on null. And then with the sharpness, we can obviously either sharpen the image greatly or blur it. Uh, I'm going to keep that at 50 where it was. And then with this gray scale, this is kind of pulling up the threshold of the light and dark in the image. So if we take the one on the left and we drag it towards the center, the darks will get darker. And if we do the inverse of that on the other side, the lights will get lighter. Okay, so again, I'm setting this up as just a regular engraving. So I can set up all the settings that I want over here, or there are some predetermined uh, material settings that the company has already put together. So if I click on one of these, like 3 millimeter basswood, uh, you can see that all of these settings are already there. Now, uh, if you wanted to change any of these, you can change this to user-defined settings, uh, and, and it'll allow you to adjust some of these things. Um, so for right now, uh, I'm going to just keep it on user-defined. But uh, if you look at this more and, uh, and, and see like all of the different things that they are, are, are showing, there's lots of different materials that are already uh, kind of uh, accounted for or tested by the company. So you can, you can pick a lot of those for the values of these objects. Okay, so power obviously goes from 1 to 100%. Uh, and you really want to do some power speed tests on any material that you are working with to find the proper speeds. Uh, really, the only way to know that is to do a test on your individual wood because there's so many factors that might uh, vary how strong or weak uh, your image is on your material. Uh, the speed obviously goes from 1 to 400 millimeters per second. Um, so that is 24,000 millimeters per minute. Um, that's pretty high. Uh, you're probably going to be around the mid-range of that um, for most things that you're working on. But again, you need to do those power, those power speed tests to, to find the proper settings for that. Uh, you can change the number of passes. And then this bitmap mode. So if it's set to grayscale, what that's going to do is, based on whatever power setting you have here, it's just going to use that as your max power, but then it'll, it'll dip down and use less power when it's on a white area. So the laser is always on, but as it gets into the lighter areas, it'll, it'll you know, get 
less powerful and then when it gets into the dark areas it'll get more powerful so it'll just go back and forth uh, trying to emulate the grayscale values of this image. Now if you go into some of these other ones all of the rest of these are, are what's called dithering and what dithering does is instead of making things out of like a grayscale image what they do is try to build up that image with dots and each one of these is a different algorithm for how it converts that image using those dots. Now unfortunately in this particular software it doesn't give you a visual representation of what each of these uh, dithering modes does. If you look in the Lightburn software or just look up these different uh, dithering modes uh, online you can see what the different um, the, the different algorithms do with those images. A really good one to use is uh, Jarvis. Uh, I see that one used quite a bit. Um, and then the last thing that we have here are these lines per centimeter. Now for, for whatever reason even if you change to inches uh, it's still showing these lines per centimeters even though you can see some of the other values in inches uh, it keeps the lines per centimeters in metric um, so that's just something to to think about um, but the way you can think of this is how obviously how many lines uh, fit in one centimeter of vertical space on your image so for every one centimeter you would have a hundred lines. Now this this number can either go up or down but really when you're working with uh, with lasers there's there's kind of a maximum resolution that your laser can handle and that's really based on the size of your laser spot. So if you look in the parameters of your laser you can see that it that it shows you uh, a laser spot. So this is this is from their website and if, if you look at this laser spot you see that you have this uh, 0.1 millimeters 0 0.06 millimeters and 0 0.06 millimeters for the different wattages of laser so what I have is the 20 watt laser so this is the vertical value so the laser in the vertical is 0.1 millimeters that means that there's only a certain amount of lines that I could fit in a centimeter before I start overlapping on those lines. So there's a there's another chart here that is called a scan gap. Since I already know that it's supposed to be 0.1 millimeters, then I know that the highest resolution that I could ever get is 254 dots per inch. Now unfortunately this is showing dots per inch and not centimeters but the the conversion from inches to centimeters is to convert the centimeters by 2.54. So if we take this 100 lines per centimeters and multiply that by 2.54 we end up with 254 dots per inch which just happens to align perfectly with this uh, scan gap data. So, we, so I know that the highest resolution that I can get with my 20 watt laser is 254 dots per inch. Now if, if you have the 5 or the 10 watt you might have a slightly uh, smaller laser spot so you can go up a little bit uh, in that resolution. But for me uh, using the 20 watt that's really the highest that you could go. So not only would these other values take longer they might end up making it look worse because then you're just reburning over the same area over and over and over again and it, it doesn't really help you. Now this number can also go down but uh, if you leave it at the hundred you're, you're probably pretty safe. Now the next thing that I wanted to show you is a, a different type of raster image. So this is my logo and as you can see this was just a regular JPEG that I brought in and uh, it's got all of this white space in here. Now uh, there's two problems with this. One, if I was just to burn this image in, the laser would go over these white spaces but just not do anything. So it's just going to take a lot of extra time to do that 
uh, because it it's trying to go over the extent of the whole image. Now, this is a JPEG without any type of alpha, but if I was to bring in a PNG that does have an alpha, you can see that I can see through these other areas. So the only areas that it's going to really worry about are the areas that are black here, and it's not going to worry about any of this negative space. Now, the other thing that uh, we might want to do with this is turn this into a vector image, because right now you see both of these are still raster, and the only thing that we can do with them is engrave. But we can convert these into uh, vector images. And a vector image is, is just line art. So you can see here, um, I just pulled one from this insert shape and then I created a circle and just dragged it out. Now what a vector image is, again, is line work and it's also scalable and it doesn't degrade with that scale because it's, it's basically just, uh, it's path data. But when I have one of these selected, I then have more options for what I can do. I can score, which will basically follow along this line and just burn an image along the line. I can engrave, which will do a fill-in of that image. Or I can do cut, which will cut that image. Um, and so let's say that I wanted to do a vector image of these images up here. Now, there is another tool up here, it's called Outline. So if I click on Outline, uh, you can uh, create an outline around your image at a threshold of this value. So if I set this value to zero, then it'll create a box around that image. But again, when you look at that, um, it's creating a box around the whole image because it's it's taken to it's taking into account the white area. Now if I came over here and then I did an outline at the same zero millimeters, now you'll see that I actually have a, a vector image that follows the contour of that black area because uh, this area was already cut out. It was a it was a image that had an alpha in it. So now I can select that. I can click on engrave and uh, and mess with it however I want. Now, let's say that I didn't have this see-through image and all I had was just this black and white uh, image with the white on it. You can come over here to this edit image tab and this will open it up in a in another window. Now I have this magic wand, an eraser, or crop. So with the magic wand, I can just select the um, the white areas, and they'll just be deselect or they'll just disappear. And it's all based on this uh, fuzziness. So the fuzziness will um, start to make a determination on like whether something is white or black or somewhere in like a gray value. This image was pretty easy because it was really just white and black. So it was easy to pick the parts that I wanted to delete. Um, but if there was ever like some pieces left over that I, that I no longer wanted, you can come in here with this uh, eraser which you can change the size of and you can you can start to adjust it uh, as well. Um, and then you can also crop the image if, it, if there was some other piece in there that you didn't want anymore. Uh, and you can crop it. So, But for right now, I'm just going to use the magic wand. And then hit save. And now, when I go to do that outline on this image, then I can get that nice vector uh, image that I got with the other PNG version. Uh, and then again, can grave, can cut, or score. Okay. So underneath image where uh, I can pull that in, and, and I can pull in vector images as well 
uh, into this um, into this software, not just those raster images that I was uh, that I was showing. Now, uh, there's only really two types that you can bring in here. It's a DXF and a SVG. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're saving a vector image from another uh, software package. Uh, and then now I can insert lines. Uh, I can you know do rectangles or circles. Uh, also, I can uh, click on these different things uh, if I have this select tool selected at the bottom or if I use this hand I can move it around. Um, I can also zoom in or zoom out using these keys over here. Uh, you can also hotkey that by hitting control and then the minus and plus keys on your keyboard. Uh, you can also pan if you're in the select tool by pressing spacebar and then letting go. Spacebar click and then and then move it around and then let go. And then you can drag select multiple things at the same time and adjust multiple things at the same time or delete them. Uh, there's a whole other list of shapes in here that you can use uh, and these are all vector images as well. And then we have uh, a whole list of text where you can change the text, the size, the, the font. Uh, again, these are also vector images, so you still have you know, the score, engrave, and cut on each of these. You can scale them up, change a bunch of the parameters. Um, underneath that is a vector drawing tool, so you can just click on a point create another point, another point, another point, another point. Now these can be left open or you can click on the first dot that you made and create a closed shape. Now if you want to not have these all just be linear points from each other you can double click on it and you can get back to where you have these vector shapes which you can still edit and move around. Now, if you don't want it to be sharp, you can double click on it and it'll open up this Bezier curve handle uh, and you can change those values as well. So you can start to build up different uh, shapes that you want to make. Now this extract button is not something that is usable on the D1 Pro. Uh, that is only used on some of the other machines from Xtool, so it's always going to be grayed out uh, when you have a D1 Pro connected. And the same thing goes for this Smart Fill up here, up at the top. Uh, I believe that has something to do with uh, the ca a camera on some of the other Xtool machines, so that will also always be grayed out. Okay, so we already went over Outline. So Array... So if I have a shape that I've generated uh, and I want to cut out multiples of these, uh, I can do a grid array and then set the number of columns and rows that I want. Uh, and that way you can just multiply the same object if you're going to be cutting a lot of the same object out, which is really nice and helpful. There is also a different type of array called a circular array. Uh, actually, let me get a star. And this will take the, so if I go to array and circular array, uh, actually let me move it off to the side so you can see what it is. It just rotates around uh, it, it, its own uh, center or you can you can change that value. Uh, so you can get like a circular pattern around it. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of different things that you can change if you want to create some sort of wacky design with something like that. Uh, obviously, we have our align tools. So let's say I just have a shape out here, and then I'm gonna Control C, Control V. Copy and paste, control C, control V. 
uh, let's say I want to select all of these and I want to, you, you know, obviously you can align them however you want. I can align everything from the top. So it's, it's just different ways of making sure that everything is on the same plane. Um, for a range, so let's say I had my image and I also had one of my Buster logos. Now, let's say I had done this in the other direction and this was behind it. Uh, so I'm going to send it to the back. Now, let's say this was how it was set up before. I can select this image and I can bring it to the front. And so it's just a, it's just a way of picking the different layers that you have for each of your um, of your images that you want to engrave. Okay, so the next thing is combine. So let's say that I had something like this star, but I wanted to do some sort of shooting star. So um, I can take this vector and I'll do something like this. And then I will make these Beziers. Let's say it was something like that. But I don't want these to uh, intersect like that. So what I can do is I can select the first image and that new image and I can combine and unite them. So now these things will combine into one. Let me move that down. So you select the first image and then the second image. So that's a way of uniting uh, those two shapes. And uh, doing Control Z to undo. Oops. Uh, you can also do a subtract where it'll cut into it. You can also do where it gives you just the overlapping section of those two faces, of those two shapes. And then finally, the subtract from the overlap. Now you might not be able to notice that this did anything. Uh, and until you go to engrave and you can see that it, it's cut out that little section there uh, and left everything else in there. Okay. And then this reflect is just a mirror. So you can mirror it from one side to the other or up and down. Okay. All right. So let's say that I had my image in there and I wanted to engrave it so I'll just say that set up to something for engraving um, so if I want to send that to the machine I just hit this start button okay so the first thing that you'll notice is this origin and if you click on this origin in uh, the this box over here, you see it changing on the picture. Or you can click on the picture itself and also move this. And what that green dot is, is where the uh, laser is going to be in relation to your piece. So that green dot is where it thinks the laser is currently at this time. So if you were doing something like a coaster, what you could do is you could put the laser in the center and then you physically put the laser in the center of the workpiece that you want to work on so that when you go and burn the laser everything is lined up to directly in the center of that object. So over here are just uh, some movement tools that you have so you can move the laser backwards or forwards. You can also press this center button and what that'll do is it'll home the machine. So the new D1 Pro comes with limit switches and what this will do is this will send that laser head to the top left corner of the machine which is what the laser believes is its zero zero position. Now 
at the time of this review, it, there's really no way in this software to to make um, to make use of those absolute coordinates. Uh, that is kind of the reason that you want to use those limit switches. I'll, I'll show you a little bit later how you can how you can do that, but really natively the way that this program works it's not set up for those absolute coordinates when you bring this image in you can only move this laser around to the extents of that image um, I'll show you how I, I get around that later but uh, for right now uh, this is how this is set up so once you feel like you have your laser in the right spot the, the origin is in the right spot click on the framing button and it'll move the laser around the extents of the image that you're trying to engrave at this 2% laser spot. So it's not going to be burning into whatever it is that you're, uh, that you're working on because the value of this laser is so little. You'll see the dot and you want to wear your safety glasses at that point, but it's, it's not going to mark the surface. It's, it's really for registration of your laser. So if everything looks good, then you click that start button and it'll send the job over to the laser. Uh, if you don't, if you're not ready to start, then you can click on this cancel button and it'll go back to uh, the other screen. Now, a couple other things in this software. Uh, the first is that you have different canvases that you can work with. So let's say I had this on one canvas. I can come down here, click this little plus sign, and I can create another canvas. So on here, I can have multiple shapes, um, do whatever I want, basically on just, uh, just another page of whatever it is that I'm working on. Now you can always go back and click on the first page of the canvas. Uh, and you can also copy and paste between these. So it's just nice because you can, you can have multiple pages in a particular project. And whenever you're ready to save it, you can just go to File, Save As, and you can save the project. And it'll save all of these pages as well. Now, uh, another thing that Xtool does in this software, which is kind of neat, is if you come over here to the top right corner, you'll see that you, know, you can go to the support website. You can also shop. But they have this Projects uh, button up here. So if you click on projects, it'll take you to all of these projects that the company just gives away for free um, that uses uh, the different lasers. And you can see that it, it's showing the M1 or the D1. Uh, it doesn't show anything specifically for the D1 Pro, so I'm assuming anything that the D1 can use, the D1 Pro could also do. But it's just all these fun little neat projects. Uh, they're all free. They're inside of here. So you can, you can just click on any of them. It gives you kind of steps for how everything gets put together, uh, you know, instructions on how to kind of assemble it or, you know, things to look out for or just the settings that they're using for cutting this. And then if you just hit Start Project, and I'm not going to save this current project that I have open. There's nothing in there. So I'm going to say No. And now you see down here we have all of these different layers in these in this different project. And so we can go through and cut each one of these out and it already has the uh, parameters set for it based on the fact that it thinks that you're using, you know, this three millimeter basswood. Again, your machine might vary based on, you know, whether you have the 20 watt or the 10 watt or uh, you know things like that so you kinda wanna check the values that it has uh, and and change those based on your material but it's kinda neat that it just gives you some projects kinda built into the software uh, that you can try out on some of your test materials or if you just want some inspiration on uh, what it is that you're doing so the next thing that I wanted to go over, and uh, I, I was kind of talking about this before, but one of the cool new features of the D1 Pro is that it has those limit switches. And what that does is it allows you to use absolute coordinates on your machine. 
And what that means is, so let's say I had this Mount Rushmore image and I had it right here at this 200x by 200y. And so if I home the machine and it puts it in this top corner, then I know that this corner of this image would be exactly at the, you know, 200 by 200. It would be right there. But the problem is when I go to to start the burn, I can't there's no other place where it can show me where that laser is going to start. So it, it's always using the current position of the laser uh, based on the image of whatever it is that you are, are working with. So what I did was uh, I created a file. So I'm going to not save this project right now. And I called it absolute coordinates. And so all, this, all that's in this file is a tiny little square up in the top that I've turned the power down to zero and the speed to 20 millimeters per, per second. And so now if I was to import that Mount Rushmore image, and let's say I wanted to put that at the 200 by 200, because that's where I'm setting my workpiece. Now, if I go in and I hit start, you'll see that I have a dot right where that square was up here, and this should still be at the uh, 200 by 200. Now, it still doesn't look like it's taking up the full space, and that's because it's still only going to the extent of where that space is. So if I was to take this and m duplicate it and then move that down. So now I have this down at this top corner at 420 to 380 because the full extent of the D1 Pro 20 watt is only 390 millimeters on the Y and 430 on the X. And that's because of the larger size of the, of the laser head. Now the 5 and 10 watt are a full 430 by 400 millimeters tall. Uh, but for the 20 watt, it only goes up to 390. So if I was to have both of these in here now and hit start, you can see that this is now putting it in the position of where it's really supposed to be. And so that's kind of a kind of hacky way to do absolute coordinates. It'd be really nice if there was a checkbox in here that just was a setting for absolute coordinates now that the machine can do it. So if the company is listing, that would be an amazing add to uh, this section. So that's pretty much it. Um, if there is anything that uh, you didn't understand that I went over that, uh, that I could be clearer about, please let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll try to answer any questions that I can. Uh, again, I don't work for Xtool and this is a beta version of the software, so I'm assuming things will change. Um, but the, this is kind of how I see it working uh, in its current state. So uh, thanks again for watching, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.